All right, Acts 5, 33, saints. Hallelujah. The Bible says in 33, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one of the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And he said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thudius, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, above about 400, joined themselves who were slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee, in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him who also perished and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Father, we thank you for the richness of your word. Blessed now our Savior. We pray I would decrease and you would increase, and that you would bless the receiving of your word as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks to God, last time we were here in the book of Acts, remember we've been in chapter 5. And Ananias and Sapphira lie unto the Holy Spirit. They're smitten. And great fear fell upon the church. And after the fear came purity. And after the purity came power. But when purity and power happens in the church, we got to watch that old devil, amen, and the vessels that he used. Because after purity and power comes persecution. So we had been studying about persecution. And I showed you how they laid hands on the apostles and how they put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them forth and told them to go and stand and speak all the words that pertain to this life. And when they heard, amen, the command of the angel, the Bible says they hazarded their lives and still went into the temple. The Pharisees and Sadducees, elders of Israel, called the council together, unaware that they had escaped from prison, sent guards to the prison to look for them and to bring them up to court. And when they got to the prison, they found no man. And they doubted where this would grow. They say, man, we done messed up. We touched this thing and may cause more trouble because a greater miracle could not happen. An angel came down and delivered them from prison. They didn't know where they was, but they were standing in the temple right under their noses. The Bible says they brought them to court and set them before the council. And read charges against him. And I told you the charges that they could have read. Contempt, disobeying the court. Heresy, as though it were bringing up false doctrine and defamation. Saying that, hallelujah, they will bring in the blood of Jesus upon the elders of Israel. Peter came with his defense. He said, we ought to obey God rather than man. He said, we got a higher court, a higher authority that we obey. He said, this is not heresy. This was the God of our fathers. And we know, amen, is the God of our fathers because he raised Jesus from the dead. Peter defended himself. He said, it's not defamation because it's true. Y'all did, y'all did kill Jesus. And so we covered all of those, and I forgot number 14 without violence, but we covered all of those uh, talking about persecution. And we want to pick up in verse 33, and the title of this message is Gamaliel. Gamaliel. Somebody, somebody said it with me. Gamaliel, you see, or you can say Gamaliel, you know, or like that boy in the hood, uh, Gmail. I mean, you know, you can call him what you want. Gamaliel is the proper pronunciation of his name. So we're going to have three points, amen, this morning. Um, the first point is a uh, cut to the heart. Second point, Gamaliel. And the third point, fight against God. Let's look at our first point, cut to the heart. The Bible says in Acts 5, 33, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart 
and took counsel to slay him. The Bible says when they heard that. And you know how we study the Bible. I always ask the question, when they heard what? You know what I'm saying? What did they hear? Well, they heard Peter's defense. How we ought to obey God and not man. How there is a higher authority than the, than the court of the Sanhedrin. How it's the God of our fathers that put this doctrine of the gospel together. It's not heresy. When they heard that, amen, it's not defamation. You really did kill Yeshua Jesus. When they heard that, Peter's defense. The Bible says they were cut to the heart. The Greek word here, cut to the heart, means not to cut physically, but to cut spiritually. Not to cut outwardly, but to cut inwardly. And that's why I say cut to the heart. But it's even deeper than just cutting. Because the Greek here intimates that it's not just a cut like a one-stroke cut, but it means to saw. Mm, mm -mm. And how many people know when they cut you, it's different than when somebody would come and saw you. The sawing is more painful than the cutting. The Bible says when they heard this, when they heard Peter's defense, they were cut to the heart, inwardly, spiritually. And not just cut, but every word that Peter said was, was, was as though it was sawing through their soul. You see what I'm saying? They were cut to the heart. And I want to tell you, how did Peter cut them? Peter cut them with the truth. Anybody ever heard that the truth hurts? <coughs> it does. And the truth is a weapon, saints. The truth is a weapon. In fact, the Bible tells us that the truth is a sword. In Ephesians 6, 16, the Bible says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? Which is the word of God. God's truth is a sword. It cuts you. And sometimes, my friend, to be frank with you, it hurts. In Hebrews 4.12, look what it says. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than what? Any two-edged sword. Not only is it a weapon, not only is it a sword, but in reality, it's sharper than any sword in existence. You see this word right here. Why? Because it divides soul and spirit. No other, soul, no other sword can divide the soul and the spirit. You see, uh, 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 the joints and the marrow, it's a discern of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word is a weapon. The truth is a weapon. The truth cuts and the truth hurts. We call it like this at Philadelphia. We call it conviction. Somebody say conviction. conviction. And there's two ways you can handle the truth. All right? And we're going to see it right here. You can handle the truth by manning up and repenting. That's the first way, repentance. Or you can get angry. You can get mad. Burn up when you hear the truth. I'm going to ask you, how do you handle the truth this morning? Huh? How do you handle the truth? Let's look at the first way you're supposed to handle it. Repentance. Repentance. You know, a different group heard the same truth that the Sanhedrin heard on that morning right here, but the response was different. At Acts 2.36, look what it says. Y'all still with me out there? It says, Peter says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made the same Jesus whom ye crucified. It's the same information, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked. And in the Greek right here, cut, where? In their heart. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, look what they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? You see the difference right there? Some people handle truth and they receive it. And they say, I heard you and I was wrong. What I need to do to correct this? Anybody hear me up in here? It's kind of like David when Nathan came and rebuked him and said, Thou art the man. David said, I have sinned 
against the Lord. All right? You can handle truth two different ways. In verse 41, as we look at Acts 2, after these people hear the truth, then they gladly receive his word. Then they that gladly receive his word were what? Were baptized. And the same day that were added unto them, how many? About 3,000 souls. You want to be this kind of truth receiver. You want to receive it gladly, and you want to receive it to the salvation of your soul. Anybody hear me up in here? All right. All right. Yes. But let me tell you another way that you can handle truth. Anger. And when we look at our text, that's exactly what we see. All right? Remember, same information, same person preaching it. All right? It's Peter. Acts 5.33. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart. And look what they did. And took counsel to slay them. All right? The Sadducees and high priests got so mad when they heard the truth. They decided, we're going to just kill them. We're going to kill them. And they had decided so unanimously that they was going to kill them. Heavy, they was just debating on how they was going to kill them. We're going to hang them. We're going to crucify them. No, no, no. Let's put them in hot water. No. You know, they took counsel together on how they was going to slay them. You see, this is true on a, a duplicity of different levels. Number one. The way you receive the truth of the gospel, all right, falls in this category as well. When people hear the gospel, they either going to repent or they going to get angry. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? That's the truth to this day. And listen, it could be the same person preaching that gospel. It could be the same gospel. It could be the same preaching event like in this room right now. Two people sitting on the side of each other. Ride, rode here in the same car. Sleep in the same bed or under the same roof. One hear the gospel and hear and receive the truth gladly. The other, anger bubble up. Oh, he calling me a sinner. He don't know me. I went to private school. I live in this neighborhood. My family got this type of hair, you know? My uncle was this, a pastor, a priest, whatever. He don't know me, you know? And the Bible says it clearly, y'all, and I'm, uh, sound good, I'm going to move around a little bit. Look, look just, just go to the last scripture in that section, 2 Corinthians 2 and 15. You'll see it there. The Bible says this. It says, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. Ministers and Christians, when we bring the gospel, we are the aroma, the savor of Christ. In them that are saved and in them that perish, we go unto the elect, but we also go unto those that won't choose God. In 16, to one... We are the savor, the aroma of death unto death. And to the other, the savor, the aroma, the smell of life unto life. The gospel. The gospel will give two different responses from two different people. One going to hear the gospel and say eternal life. The other one going to run away from it. Like it's the stench of death. I'm asking you this morning, which one are you? When you hear that you're a sinner and that because of your sin, the wages of sin is death. When you hear, amen, that there's no way that you can wash away your sins. When you hear that your righteousness to God is like filthy rags and no matter what you do and throw on your sin, guess what still remains? Sin. And when you die unforgiven, Unwashed and in unbelief, you're going to bust hell wide open. And there will be no purgatory to receive you because there's no such thing as a purgatory. 
What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And it's only, it's only by that blood and faith in that blood that you can be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believing in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You got to have a faith from the heart. A faith so strong it changes the way you operate with God. A faith so strong when God sees it, amen, he gives you what's called regeneration and you're born again. And the places you used to go, you don't go no more. The people you used to hang with, you don't want to be around that no more. You're a new person, a new creature. That's the gospel, saints. How do you feel when you hear it? Do you smell life? Or do you smell death? Do you love it and run to it? Or do you run away from it? There's two ways to handle truth. Come on, give God some glory, amen. But it's not just the gospel, it's every truth, really. And some can come in here, prophetess, Miss Iola, and hear the truth. And I'm not even preaching the gospel, but maybe I'm talking about their particular sin. And they not only get mad at the gospel, but they get mad at the sermon. Just a regular sermon. I could be talking about tithing or drunkenness or fornication or shacking up. It could be anything. And my question to you is, will you be like the Sanhedrin who say, let's slay him? Or are you going to be like the other group that say, let's get saved and let's get baptized? Amen. All right? The gospel, sermons, but not just in church. Because truth confronts you even out in the world. When you're at home and your wife tells you something. Man of God, are you a person that get angry at the truth? Or do you receive it? You see? Woman of God, when that husband, amen, take his role and say, no, nah, we're not going to do that this time. And he give you the reason why. Or he rebuke you about your attitude or the way you've been acting. Woman of God, do you receive that truth? With repentance or with anger? That's a good prayer, huh? Help us, Lord. <laughs> Children of God, when your parents confront you and point to your sin and tell you, listen, this is what you're doing and this is how your life go in. Do you run in their room and slam their door and lock their door now <laughs> and get angry? Jumping on their bed? <coughs> or do you receive that reproof with repentance? You see? Yeah, 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 yeah. Two ways to handle truth. Listen, there's many scriptures, but we're not going to all go through it. But the Bible got a, a slew of different examples from King Ahab and the prophet Micaiah. There's Israel, the whole nation, in Jeremiah. There's Ahab and Elijah. Joash and Zechariah. There's the whole world in Jesus. You see? And Jesus says, the world cannot hate you, talking to his brothers that was unsaved. He said, but me it hated. Why does the world hate you, Jesus? Because I testify of it. That the works thereof are evil. You see? Don't be a hater of truth. Be a lover of truth. In Jesus' name. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I, the reason why we love truth, because the Bible says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You'll never be free if you hate the truth. And listen, truth can come from the, the strangest places. You see? Somebody that don't know, don't know anything half the time gonna come and tell you that one truth to your face. You say, well, Pastor, he can't speak through her. He can't speak through him. What you mean? 
He spoke through a donkey to Balaam. Look, that donkey turned around, Paul, what's wrong with you? So don't discount people because they, you know what I'm saying? Because me, I'm not listening for them anyway. I'm not listening for them. I'm listening for God. Hallelujah. All right. All right. Let's move on to our second point. Gamaliel. Let's talk about him. Acts 5 and 34. Then stood up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. Gamaliel, Gamaliel. I just like to say it fast. Gamaliel. A doctor of the law. Had him reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. The Bible says in 34, then, this means after their wicked intentions to kill the apostles. This means after they all had agreed, listen, all right, we're going to kill them this way. We introduced to a new character, a new man in the Bible that we had never seen before. And his interposition into the situation actually saves the apostles. This man is a man by the name of Gamaliel. And the Bible tells us that Gamaliel was one of the council. This means that he was one of them, a member of the elite, 160 le 116 leaders and judges of Israel, a man of substance, a man of authority. <coughs> the Bible says not only he was one of them, but the Bible says he was a Pharisee. He was a religious man, opposite of the Sadducees, another denomination of the Hebrews that believed in spiritual things, the resurrection, angels, the soul. The Bible says he was not only one of them, a Pharisee, but the Bible says he was a doctor of the law. This means he was a scribe. In our day, that would mean he would be a lawyer, a jurist doctrine. Uh, this also means that he was not only a jurist, doctor, a scribe, a lawyer, but he was a teacher of the laws of God, this Gamaliel. You see? In fact, the Bible tells us that one of his students was none other than Paul the Apostle. This man taught Paul, he taught Paul Torah. He taught Paul uh, uh, the Pentateuch. And Paul wrote two-thirds of our New Testament. You see? Paul testifies of it himself in Acts 22 and verse 3. He says, I am verily a man which am a Jew. Paul is talking about himself. I'm a Hebrew, Paul says, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city, Jerusalem. But look where he was brought up, at the feet of Gamaliel. And taught according to what? The perfect manner of the law of the Father. Who was his teacher? Gamaliel. And Paul said, I was zealous towards God, as ye are all this day. So this dude trained Paul up. This is a major dude. The Bible says he was a Pharisee, a doctor of the law. But guess what? He was a man in reputation among how many? All the people. This means that all the Hebrews knew Gamaliel. And he had a good reputation, gent. He wasn't like them boys in the church with a bad reputation with this one down, cutting up. No, no, no. That's not Gamaliel. He had a good reputation. They knew him for wisdom. They knew him for honor. He was highly valued. He was highly trusted. This is Gamaliel. Well, what did he do, saints? What did he do? I'm glad you asked. The Bible says in verse 34, he stood up. He stood up. Then stood Gamaliel. He stood up. He stood up for truth. He stood up for God. And he stood up for the gospel. When everybody else in the room, Kelly, 115 other people were saying, let's kill him. It's heresy. They in contempt. This one man stood up and said, uh-uh, it ain't going down like that. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. When everybody else was going one way, Gamaliel went another way. He stood up. When he stood up, he said, put the apostles forth a little space. This means that 
Let's have a recess in this court. We're going to adjourn for a second here. Put the apostles outside for a second because we have to talk, Gamaliel says. You see? So he not only stood up, but the second thing Gamaliel did, he spoke up. He spoke up. He stood up and he spoke up. You see? This gave me two revelations on this spoke up right here. Number one, God will sometimes have someone in a key location, a key, lo a key position to speak up for his people in a key time. Anybody hear me up in here? A key person in a key position to speak up for his people at a key time, a right time, a right time. That's Gamaliel. And a lot of times, amen, you won't even perceive that person that before the time. The apostles never knew that Gamaliel was there. They never knew that anybody would stand up for them. So we can call this an unexpected deliverer. Say that with me. An unexpected deliverer. Christian, you got to learn to watch for God to move through like, like this. When you need him to show up and show out. When you need to get the job, you need the bill paid, you need that healing, you need to get approved for this mortgage. You, 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 you're in court and something bad doesn't happen, but you need somebody. You got to be on guard, be on the watch for an unexpected deliverer. You hear me, somebody? Woo! You see, this right here, amen, is a deep thing for the church. Because I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you right here the ways of God. See, some people think that God can only move in the supernatural. Through the miraculous. Through the splitting seas and the raining bread from heaven. But God can also do miracles through a natural delivery process. Anybody hear me up in here? That's like the man praying in the flood. Lord, save me. Y'all remember that one? And they pull up in the car and tell him, get in. The flood is coming. No, I'm waiting on God. That was a natural deliverer. That was God through natural means. And the waters come up. Somebody come up in the boat. He said, no, nah, I ain't getting in the boat. I'm waiting on God. You, you, you imbecile. That was God. That was God through a natural deliverer. And the water gets to the roof. He climb up on the rooftop. And the helicopter come and roll down the ladder. He said, nah, I'm waiting on God. Oh, my goodness. Somebody slap this man. <laughs> God sent a natural deliverer. He get to heaven and say, God, you failed me. I was waiting on you. God said, cool young. <laughs> I said, on a car, a boat, and a helicopter. Can you see God move through natural means? Are you one of those that only can see the supernatural deliveries? Can you see God work through a doctor? Can you see him work through a judge? Can you see him work through a lawyer? Can you see him work through your wife, a husband, your child? Can you see him work through a policeman? Can you see God deliver through natural means? Listen, this, listen. An angel delivered them, supernatural means, from jail. But a judge delivered them from the courthouse. Can you see God when God moves? You see what I'm saying? I love this. this. This teaches us something here. You see? God will touch somebody in your situation. He'll touch somebody. The Bible says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And as the rivers of water, <coughs> he turned them, whithersoever he will. And you got to keep your eyes open because in that situation, you need God to show up. God can turn somebody's heart. He can turn somebody's heart at the drop of a dime. And somebody like Gamaliel stand up in your presence and say, nah, it's not going to go down that way. 
not for God's people. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. The second revelation is this. There are times when we must be ready to speak up for God's people ourselves. In the first revelation, I was beseeching you to look for Gamaliel. In this revelation, look to be a Gamaliel. Look to be that vessel. Look to be that person. Look to be that key person in a key position in a key situation to deliver God's people. Anybody hear me up in here? Be a Gamaliel. Church history tells us that Gamaliel was actually a secret Christian. He was a sympathizer to the way. He was like a Nicodemus. He was like a Josephus. It's almost like our God, amen, was the first person to deal in espionage. Woo, come on, somebody. He had a secret agent on the inside sitting on the court, sitting in the jury to help his people out. You got to open your eyes and begin to see yourself, a God, as an agent of the Most High, as a representative of Christ, as an ambassador. And you got to realize that, amen, when a country has a secret agent, Sometimes that country or put that agent in key positions and key spots, amen, not for the agent, oh God, but for the kingdom that the agent represents. You looking at your position as though God did it just for you. But God put you there because later on he knew somebody that he loved would be coming through. Hey, listen to me. That's what Mordecai was telling Esther. Amen. He told Esther that in Esther 4 and 14. He said, Esther, he said, listen, who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Whatever job you have, whatever position you have, you don't know a God if God done put you there for such a time as this. You got to... You got to look for those times. You got to look for those seasons. It's like Miss Rose and teaching that Bible study in that little neighborhood. You're thinking that you're just teaching that Bible study for this and that. But God knows that a little boy going to come through that. Little boy with green eyes, a little knucklehead, a little boy. And, and, and he got to get the gospel. The only way you can present the gospel is... You was put there in that neighborhood, in that house, on that back street for such a time as this. And in teacher, you got to know you the same way. You in that school for that year during teaching that class for such a time that it could be one student. It could be one situation. Lawyer, business owner. Listen, listen. It could be one situation. Learn to see yourself as a Gamaliel. This is a, this is a, it's a truism that runs throughout scripture. As we look at Joseph. Mm, God. Joseph was put in a position not even for himself. Now, though God saw that God's people would be in trouble later on down the road, and God, who knows the end from the beginning, says, I see a famine that's coming, and it's going to affect the whole land. And if I don't do something, then my posterity, the people of God that I brought, hey, together and called from Abraham's seat, they all going to die from this famine. So I got to get me somebody. In a key position, a key situation. And Joseph realized this. Listen, I'm going to read it to you. In Genesis 45, 5, Joseph says, listen, 45, 7, he says, listen, God sent me before you to preserve you. To preserve your posterity in the earth. To save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph says, you got to see yourself as a Gamaliel. 
You got to watch for God's people coming through in your presence. You can't just do your job just putting widgets and fixing this and not be uh, uh, observant to the movements of God's creation around you. You got to see him move. You got to have as though it were a, a, a discernment into the ways of God. You got to see God playing chess and, chess and ask God, why did you move me this piece right here? And why is this other piece close to me? And what's going to happen with this move and, and that move? And A Gamaliel. Now when you see God's people come before you in your position, in your job, in your situation, and you see God's people need a little bit of help. You got to stand up and you got to speak up. The Bible tells us in Galatians 6.10, as we therefore have opportunity, God's going to give you some opportunities to save and to bless his people like Esther, like Joseph, like Gamaliel. As we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men. But look what he say, especially unto them who are of what? The household of faith. Amen. Now, I'm going to break this thing down for you, all right? Number one, you're going to have to learn how to be good to Hebrews like yourself, all right? I got to teach this because we have been brought up and engineered socially engineered to hate ourselves and to hate how we look and so you can get a hebrew come in there who of the household of faith you ain't gonna be good to him what i'm saying is you got to renew your mind he put joseph there for joseph people he put esther there for esther people you in a key position but you that just for you when you gonna start living for something greater than you and start Start looking out for your people. Now, now, listen to me. The world look out for the world. If we was of the world, they would love us. But we not of the world. You understand what I'm saying? So the world not looking out for me. Can somebody please look out for me? Can, I, can the church look out for the church? Can Christians look out for Christians? Can Hebrews look out for Hebrews? So to me, deacon, the first step is to teach Philadelphia and the other Hebrews that's out there, look out for your people, man. You're the only people that don't look out for one another. You're the only people, you ain't trying to, you know what I'm saying? Look out for your people, man. For who knows? Mm. If you was raised up, put in that position, high, given that promotion, for such a time as this. Secondly, I want to expand this because it's time for you not to only just look out for the Hebrew, but every believer, every person that's of the household of faith. And, and, and you see, <coughs> I start off with the first one because y'all ain't got no problem looking out for folk that don't look like y'all. Y'all ain't got no problem with that. Y'all Hebrew haters, but y'all love everybody else. All right? Yeah, yeah. Y'all, you're going to give somebody else a hook up, and, you know, but that's just the way you're wired. You know? But what I'm telling you is go ahead and continue to love the other races and be good to them, especially the household of faith. But go ahead and throw your people in there, too. Come on, give God some glory. Amen? Now, now let me show you something. If Christians and Hebrews get on one accord, helping each other and supporting one another, being down for one another, you come before me and you in a little bind, listen, I got you. White, black, Latino, whatever. You know why? Because listen, you're my brother and you're my sister in the Lord. You with me so far? Why? Well, the, the, the Luciferians doing it. 
when they figure out that one of them are Illuminati or one of them in the secrets, they help each other. When they figure out that one of them, amen, they, that they, they're in the world and they'll do, they help each other. Why the church can't do that? That's all I'm saying. I'm moving on. You know? I'm moving on. Help your people and help all Christians be a Gamaliel. Come on, give God some glory. Amen? <coughs> Here we go. Let me give you another point. Fight against God. Fight against God. This is our third and, and final point. Let's look at Acts 5 and 35. We'll look at Gamaliel's speech, his case, his, his reasoning, his, his, how did he persuade them to not kill the apostles? First, he gave a warning, y'all. Secondly, he gave examples. And then thirdly, he gave a rule. There was a warning, some examples, and a rule. A warning, some examples, and a rule. So let's start off with the warning. He said unto them, ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. Remember, they want to kill the apostles. Gamaliel stood up. He said, go ahead, put the apostles out, brothers. I want to talk with y'all. He told them this. He said, take heed. That, that phrase, take heed, it means to be careful. It means to beware. It means to be on guard. It means that before you act, you better use your mind. You better put your mind on what you're about to do. You know, take heed, beware, be careful. I love what he says. He said, take heed to yourselves. He said, be careful, not for them. They're all right. You can hurt them. They're going to be, to be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. They're all right. He said, don't, don't take heed to them. He said, take heed, be careful for yourself. Oh, that's good stuff right there. <coughs> the danger is not really towards them. The danger is to you. Your own person. If you handle these men wrongly, if you handle the, this situation wrongly, it cannot turn out good for you. Be careful the way you handle these men. You see? Why? These could be men of God, Gamel, you're saying. This could be servants of the Most High. Amen. This could be people doing the Most High's will on an errand from heaven with a message from the king. Be careful how you handle them. In fact, there's a psalm that talks about it. Psalm 105.15 says this. It says, touch not mine anointing and do my prophets no harm. Don't touch them. Don't touch them with your hand. Don't touch them with your mouth. And don't you inspire nobody else to touch them. <coughs> Gamel, you say, be careful. Take heed. To what? To yourself. A.B. Simpson says this. He says, a preacher, he says, I would rather play with lightning or taking my hands live wires with fiery current. You know when wires sparking and current coming out? He said, I'd rather put my hands on that than speak a reckless word against any servant of Christ, Yahshua, and the Most High. Anybody hear me up in here? Well, see, I'd rather play with lightning. You see, because playing with lightning is playing with a lesser power. Oh, God. <laughs> I'd rather play with the lightning than the one that gave birth to the lightning. I'd rather play with the wire. Hey, God. Instead of the one who run the electricity through the wire. He says this, let us remember that when we persecute or hurt the children of God, we are persecuting him, and we only hurting ourselves far more. Take heed to yourselves. Be careful. Listen, whether you agree with something or not, be careful. 
whether you think that it's a move of God or not, be careful. In this situation, Gamaliel is trying to give him some wisdom. He's trying to say, y'all better humble yourself. You don't know everything that God's doing. His ways hide in our ways. His thoughts hide in our thoughts. Don't you act like that everything God do, he going to send you a memo first. There could be some things that God doing in the earth that you don't know about. You're not privy to. You're, you don't have clearance for what God is doing in the earth. You don't have top secret clearance. Your, your, hey, God, your badge, your, your status. You know what? You a G4. This is G30 stuff. You... But just because you ain't get the memo, this can't be real. This can't be God. Be careful now. Be careful now. Be careful. And if we would just really look at ourselves for a second, and where we are as far as our maturity level in the kingdom of God, we would be more humble than we are. Hello. We act like God got a check with us. And Gamaliel was saying, listen now, be careful now. Be careful. And this, this blesses my heart in regards to this new move that's coming through. The regathering of God's Hebrew people. This blesses my heart. Because I want to say it like Gamaliel to all the haters out there. Take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourself. Why? Because you're putting your mouth on something that you don't have the clearance for. You don't have the clearance for. You a baby in relation to regular Christians. You ain't no deacon. You ain't no minister. And you ain't no pastor. And when regular Christians get around you, they seem super spiritual and you seem carnal. The most carnal ones, the most baby ones, are the ones that are saying, this movement can't be of God. When I say, you so young in the faith, you so carnal in your Christianity. You wouldn't see God if you ran into him going 50 miles per hour. Take heed now. And take heed how you deal with the vessels that's bringing it. Because <laughs> what if? What if this thing be of God? And God has begun to raise up a remnant in the earth. A whole new generation of Moseses and Elijahs and Isaiahs. A, a whole new movement of, 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 of Joshua's. A whole new movement. And, and there you go putting your mouth on that. And the people that God raised up. Take heed to yourself now. Take heed to yourself. If you ain't got nothing good to say, you better just be, be quiet. You don't have the clearance for that. You don't have the clearance for that. You're going to know the truth. That's how I'm going to know the truth. You're going to know it. The truth is going to set you free. That's how you know it. You know it because it begins to set a people free. And you're going to know truth ministers. You're going to know his ministers. How are you going to know? You shall know them by their Take heed, now. And listen, take heed how you talk about all the children of God. All of his children. The touch not mine anointing, and do my prophet no harm, apply to us all. Don't talk about, don't mess with any of us. 
you know? If you knew that there was a man of power and substance, a man in the city, that when he spoke, things happened, you wouldn't play with that man's children. That man say a word and you don't have a job no more. You, you, you'd be a fool to play with that man's children. Why? That's a man of authority. That's a man of power and a man of substance. You would be a fool to touch a man of powers and authority's children. Why would you be a fool? Because that, he loves his children. Oh, 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 woman of God. She loves her. You'd be, a, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be an imbecile. You'd be a straight up fool. Now let me bring that into reality now. If you wouldn't do that to a man and a man's child, why would you ever think to do it to God's children? We just talking about jobs and just privileges in the city. This dude keep your heart beating. He keep you well. And right now my science is acting up. I am, listen, listen, I appreciate good health right now. You, you understand what I'm saying? All that pollen and stuff, it's kind of it pollen. Woo! Anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about him. Don't mess with his children. Don't mess with his children. I'm talking about all of his children. And as you move up into the church, amen, it, you know, his, his, his officers, his deacons and ministers, you know, first lady and pastor, all that. Man, look, just, just don't even mess with that, man. That's what Gamaliel was saying. Listen, you could talk about something else, man. You could go and hurt somebody else. You could... It's not worth it, man. It's not worth it, man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help y'all here, man. <laughs> look what he says here. Touch not my knowing and do my problem no harm. Secondly, Gamaliel gives examples of men who weren't of God and faded away. Gamaliel is breaking it down to the boys. He's like, look, we don't have to touch them. If it's not of God, it's going to come to naught. It's going to fade away. We ain't got to put our mouth on it. We ain't got to kill them. We ain't got to do nothing like that. Why? Because if it's not of God, it's not going to be successful. It's going to fade away. It's going to come to naught. He give two examples of that. Uh, uh, Thutius, we normally pronounce that Thaddeus, but it's Thutus. And, and they, get, they get Thutus from uh, a derivation of Judas. Everybody was naming their child, their children Judas in that day. We think of Judas as a bad name, but it was actually a good name during the days of Jesus, amen. Uh, because it's a, it's a derivative of Judah, which means praise, amen. And so uh, Thutus and, and Judas, he gives those examples in 38. He says, uh, and now I say unto you, Refrain from these men. Don't, don't do what you're thinking about doing. Let them alone. Why? For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. You know? It will come to naught. It, it, it'll come to nothing. You see? Where we at, Joe? Where we at? So he talked about Judas in 37. Plenty of people following him, but when Judas died, it was all over and everybody was scattered. You see? He talked about Thutis in 36. Plenty of followers boasting himself to be somebody. 400 people following him. When he died, they were all scattered and it was brought to none. You see? You see? You don't have to touch him. If it's not of God, ain't nothing shaking. Let's look at the rule, number three. Let's look at the rule. Here's the rule. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest happily you be found even to fight against God. I love it. He says, but if this thing be of God, you see. The thing about it is, is, is that Judas died, Judas died, and their movements stopped. Gamaliel was saying, just like those leaders died, Jesus died too. The leader of the apostles 
the disciples, he died too. Y'all just wait a while. All of his disciples gonna scatter. He dead. It's how it work. You cut the head off, it's gone. The head is dead. So he thought. But the rule is, but if it be a God, you cannot overthrow it. I like that song that Beatham sung last Sunday. Who can stand against the Lord? No one can. No one will. Who can stand against the king? No one can. No one will. They say victory belongs to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Psalm 115.3, our God is in heaven and does whatever he pleases. Meaning that, listen, if it's not of God, it's going to come to nothing. But if it's of God, y'all can't do nothing with it. You can't stand against him. You see, you see, in uh, Daniel 4.35, look, Nebuchadnezzar, after he woke up from eating, eating, eating grass, 435, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing to him. And he do it according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And listen, look what it says. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Gamaliel is trying to summarize all the teachings about God that they would have learned in the Old Testament. If it's not of God, it's going gonna, it's, it's, it's gonna to die. But if it's of God, fellas... Y'all can kill them. Y'all can kill whoever y'all want. It don't matter what y'all do. If this thing be of God, hey, you cannot overthrow it. Come on, give God some glory. Amen. I think about a few things to close, close and wind down. I think about your life and how God have a purpose for you and God have blessings for you. Businesses for you, houses for you, lands and investments for you, joy and peace, and hallelujah, all those great things for you, the blessings of the Lord just stored up for you. And I think about people trying to stop you from getting that. I think about people trying to stop you from getting that. Whether it be friends or family or employers, People in your neighborhood, just haters. I, I, I think about that, you know? And this rule applies to you. I want to speak this rule over you. What rule? That if God, if this thing be of God, if God is for you, mm, if God is for you, who can be against you? Listen, listen, they can't overthrow you. They can't stop you. All right? They can't stop you. And when you learn how to walk with God, listen, listen, the reality of it is we the ones that, that stop ourselves. When you learn how to walk with God and just let God do it, when you just learn how to let God do it, just get out of the way. I, you see, Cool, that's been one of the most important lessons of my life. They look at me, the little different things that, that I got going on, and, this, that, and they're like, oh, oh, listen, listen, listen. You want to know Pastor's secret? Pastor gets out of the way. I get out of the way. When I discern him, Danny, look what I do. Go ahead. You want to start a church? Go ahead. You want to get another building? Go ahead. You want to open up another law firm? Go ahead. You want, what you want to do? Just go ahead. I don't want to be in your way. Go ahead. The beauty about letting God go ahead, right, is this. If it were, praise the Lord. If it don't work, well, God, you did. That was you. That was you. You know what I'm saying? But the other beauty is, is that he can't fail. It's impossible. I just, I'm telling you, Maisha, I just look. Go ahead. That's, that's my secret to life. I don't fight against him. 
And there's some times where I have my own opinions about how something should work. But when I hear him and I feel him and his pressure coming, it's friction. My way is it, friction happening with my way. I got my way, but it's friction. You see what I'm saying? You could tell there's, there's, there's a peace that's on God's way. There's a, and so I, I, I discern that friction there. And I say, God, you must, there's a chance you want to do something else. You know? I've learned to let go and let God have his way. I, I, and when you do that, there's nobody that can stop you. Because, you see, when you're doing it your way, it's easy to stop you. The devil can stop you because it's your plans, it's your ideas, it's your intellect, it's your strength. Right? But when it's God and it's his plan, who can stand against the Lord? No one can. And no one will. You got behind you the locomotive of heaven. And it's, it's, it's just coming through there. You just, they can't stop your promotion, your raise, your business. They can't stop none of that. They could, they could say what they want and do what they want. My God, I... If it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. I think secondly about our new identification as a people. You see? If this thing be of God, you cannot overthrow it. And all around the nation, the bones going to rise. All around the nation, the people going to lift up and wake up. It don't matter what the media say. It don't matter what the news say. It don't matter what the Ashkenazis say. It don't matter what all the other races say. If this thing be of God, there is no one that can overthrow it. There will be an awakening like nobody's business. What you got to learn is just step out of God's way. And let God have his way with that. And the wise one's going to jump on the locomotive too. And say, go get him, God. Yeah, 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 you can't overthrow it. The last thing I think about is the gospel. The church. The kingdom. And that's what is going on in this text it, Gamaliel was telling them boys, he said, listen, listen, listen. All the other leaders that died, their movements in. Jesus is dead, isn't he? <laughs> well, then the movement going to end. But if it be of God. You cannot overthrow it. Now, Jesus died some 2017, 20 years ago. And if Gamaliel's rule would hold true, then the church should be dead. His disciples, his followers should be scattered and come to naught. But here we are. Halfway around the world in 2017, sitting in a church in Lafayette, Louisiana, still lifting up the same name, Yahshua, Jesus Christ, if this thing be of God. You cannot overthrow it, and many have tried to overthrow it. Many have tried to take the gospel, take the Bible, kill the people of God, but we still here. We still here. We still here. They've talked about us, said our Bible wasn't real, say it was the Big Bang and evolution. They've talked about this and that and tried to winnow away what we think is right and what is wrong, amen. But guess what? We are still here we still here we still here they done killed a bunch of us 
beat people in China, beat them in uh, the Middle East, amen. Hallelujah, uh, tell them to recant their faith and join Islam. And through all of that, the church is still here. I got a word for you. But if this thing be of God, then you can't overthrow it. Lest you find yourself fighting against God. Listen to me good. If you're here this morning and this word doesn't touch you. From the very beginning, you know that God was talking to you. When we was talking about truth and how you receive it. Whether you're going to get angry with it or you're going to receive it and repent. When we talked about Gamaliel and God putting people in key positions, amen, to help his people along the way. And when we talked about, amen, the movement, the movement of the gospel, amen, when we talked about the movement of the gospel, hallelujah, and how the world has tried to come against this gospel, come against the cross, come against Jesus, but he's still here. And his church is still here. And I want to tell you, saints, that heaven and earth is going to pass away, but his word is never going to pass away. There will always be Christians. There will always, hallelujah, be Hebrews. There's always, they all, we always going to be here. The people of God are always going to be here. You see? Because God is still here. I talked to the one who was a person like myself, who fought against God who talked against the Bible, who said that the Bible was written by a certain race and it's a book that's been corrupted. I used to say stuff like that. Amen. But what I didn't realize was that I was fighting against God. And the very one I was fighting against was the one who wanted to give me a life that was worth living. Is that you today? Are you fighting against him? Are you kicking against the gold like Paul the apostle? You see? The Lord, amen, is so good. Why is he good, pastor? Because God makes friends out of enemies. He makes sons, amen, out of people who used to terrorize his kingdom. And I'm so happy today that God looked down upon me just like he did Paul and took a form of persecutor of the church and made me a preacher of the faith I used to persecute. Who am I talking to today? Who am I talking to? Listen, today it's time for you to wave that white flag, to declare like this song that, listen, you will never have victory against God because God, the victory belongs to Jesus. We can't fight against him. We can't win, y'all. What do I do, Pastor? Don't get mad. Repent. Admit you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus Christ. And confess him as your Lord and Savior. I'm going to open up the altar. When I open up the altar, amen, I want those who doubt their salvation, who are fighting against God on the down low, to come and give their, their souls to the Lord. Secondly, Christians, because don't you know a Christian can fight against God? Yeah, you saved, but you don't listen to God with what he wants you to do. You like Jonah. When he told you to go this way, you're going another way. And you done found yourself in the belly of a well. I want to spring you free this morning, Christian. I'm going to help you this morning. And after this prayer service at the altar, God's going to spit you up on dry land. And you're going to begin to walk in his ways. There's another group I want to call up today. I want to call up Gamaliel's. People that God going to raise up and put in key positions for key situations and key times so that when God's people need something, God can use them as natural deliverers. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm a Gamaliel. I want to be a Gamaliel. I want to be a Gamaliel. I want to be a Gamaliel. Listen, I'm going to open up the altar. The gates are open. Come on. Come on to this altar. If you fall into one of those categories, come to this altar. Come to this altar. You can keep the music going. 
Yes. Praise the Lord. 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 I appreciate y'all putting up with my runny nose and my stuffiness. I pray it didn't stop y'all from hearing his voice. You see? It's a special time in the church. It's a time of rising up. If you're ready to rise, throw the one up. Yes. And that's where you're going, straight up. Straight up. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up, rise up on wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall, shall walk and not faint. Let's pray. Somebody say, God, God most, high, most high, thank you, thank you for, loving me. for loving me. I admit, I admit I've, sinned against you, I've sinned against you, and I'm sorry, and I'm sorry but, I but I believe that you have a plan for me. Plan for me. And, I and I believe that you died on the cross, died on the cross. For, all my sins. for all my sins. I believe you were buried. I believe you were buried. And on the third day, you rose, you rose with all power. With all power. Lord, Lord, save me, save me. A, sinner. a sinner. Take all my sins. Put them under the blood of Jesus. Put them on the cross of Jesus. And take the righteousness of my Lord and wrap me in it. Clothe me in the righteousness of Yahshua, Jesus Christ. I confess, I confess you as my Lord, as my Lord and, my and my Savior. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Show, me Show me my purpose. Make me a Gamaliel. Put me in positions, Put me in positions where, I where I can help your people. I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready, Lord. Use, me. Use me. Send me. Send me in Jesus' name. In Amen. Come on, give God some glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to pray for you and pray for me. And we're going to dismiss and depart. Amen. God's been good to us, saints. Look for him. Look for him. Look for him in the everyday motions and movements of life. He's working. He's working. See it and join in. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance. Good to see you. Thank you, Lord. May he lift up his countenance upon you. And give you peace. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. A Gamaliel. May he make you 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 a Gamaliel. Hallelujah. Peace and prosperity. In the right place. At the right time. For such a time as this. In Jesus mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Love y'all. Be blessed saints. Be blessed. Love y'all. Hallelujah. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. All the time. Precious. You're precious. <laughs>